Hello, everybody, and welcome to a podcast dealing with the historical survival of megafauna in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, my distinguished guest is um, Dr. Advait Zuka, and um, the main conversation is based on uh, an important paper he wrote this year called Late Quaternary Extinctions in the Indian Subcontinent. Um, and I think that this is actually one of the most important papers to come out recently, analyzing the extinction of large animals from the Indian subcontinent. Um, so I would just like Dr. Uh, well, Advait um, to, to, to maybe, maybe talk about, um, like, I mean, are you a mammalogist or a paleontologist or a zoologist? How do you define your job? I uh, define myself as a vertebrate a paleontologist, but I also put on uh, a bunch of different hats, like like a paleoecologist or a biogeographer. A lot yeah. of the work that I do has to do with the with the distribution of animals through time and how that changes. Yes, so uh, pr principally a vertebrate paleontologist, and you're probably following on the footsteps of people like uh, Alfred Sherwood Romer and uh, Robert Carroll and many many others who have written major books about this, well, about related subjects. Uh, so, um, so before I just as an introductory um, thing, I, I would uh, an introductory remark. I would like to refer uh, the listeners to an important book that was written by somebody called Philip J. Darlington in 1957, called the Zoogeography: Zoo The Geographical Distribution of Animals, in which he stated that there are five worldwide um, families of mammals. Um, so the five five worldwide mam uh, families of mammals that are I mean, uh, non-flying terrestrial mammals are squirrels, cats, dogs, rabbits, and um, I think, well, what's the fifth one? Oh, yes, mustelids. Uh, now, he doesn't mention another family that used to be roaming all around the world, uh, which for obvious reasons it's not really extant anymore, at least in historical times, which is the elephant family. The elephant family was found all across the world. And... Um, um, would you go along with me, Dr. Zou, um, Advait, uh, um, in, in agreeing that that before recent times, the world was dominated or the world had far more large mammals? Oh, absolutely. You know, since you mentioned elephants, there were about 17 species of elephants which were on the planet about 50,000 years ago. And most of them go extinct by about 12,000 years. And we're, we're, we're left today with three species, two in Africa and one in Asia. Uh, yeah. it, it, this is this uh, this extinction of of these large beasts is called the megafaunal extinction. And it's called the megafaunal extinction because it preferentially impacted large animals. So animals like the mammoths in the northern hemisphere, or diprotodons, which are these giant wombat-like animals in Australia, yeah. or the elephant birds in Madagascar. All of these large species go extinct, and we also see extinctions in the Indian subcontinent, which is which was the focus of my study. Yes. Um, now, um, the, 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 there was this one, there was this uh, much, there's a much talked about event that took place about three million years ago, uh, when I say much talked about, at least in the books I've looked at, uh, called the Great Faunal Interchange, when North America and South America uh, joined together. That's three million years ago, isn't it? About 2.7, but yeah, yeah. So this, it's called the Great American Biotic in, in, in Interchange. And it's called that because animals from North America go south and animals from South America go north. Uh, and this was caused by a change in plate te tectonics, which caused the Isthmus of Panama to form, so a, a, a land bridge form. Now, the, in, the interchange was actually going on for a long time because there was a chain of islands between North and South America. So right. we do see yeah. some species of ground sloth move across from South America to North America much before that. Yes. But the major phase of this interchange seems to have taken place in the earliest part of the Pleistocene. So that's after about 2.7 million years. Year. Well, that's a that's a really good starting point to 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 talk about because um, most of our discussion is uh, is about the Pleistocene and uh, and a little bit of the Holocene, and uh, I think that there has been a bit of a revision of the um, the definition of the Pleistocene, but it begins roughly about two and a half million years ago, doesn't it? Yep, absolutely. So I think for a long time the Pleistocene started at about one point eight million years, yes. but I think about a decade ago they pushed it back to two point five eight. Uh, yes. which is at the Gauss-Mariama uh, geomagnetic boundary. Yes. Now, um, the Great Faunal Interchange caused a gigantic uh, 
extinction of, uh, of mammals, well, a large extinction of mammals, especially in South America, uh, because of the dominant uh, nature of the placental mammals from North America. Is this the case? Well, it's still unclear what caused uh, this, you know, this, this large scale of faunal turnover in South America. Some people think it's because placentals tend to be more successful at reproduction than marsupials. We, we, we've seen this in Australia where you get uh, placental predators come in and the, and the native marsupials start to go extinct. But I think what's going on in, in South America is this uh, concurrent change in, in habitats as well. Once you get into the Pleistocene, you start seeing this increased aridification because the Isthmus of Panama, when it formed, it changed ocean currents. And when these ocean currents changed, it, it initiated the formation of the ice sheets in the Northern hemisphere. And once a lot of ice started to form, the climate started to change, it started to cool, it started to get drier. And a lot of these North American taxa, which moved down, were better uh, adapted to living on grasslands. And these are the species which we see make it through. So yeah. it's, it's, it's probably a combination of uh, physiological and reproductive adaptations that, pl that placental hal uh, placentals had over marsupials in addition to these adaptations to these more open environments. So uh, during the, the great faunal interchange, um, uh, the vast majority of mammals that became extinct in South America were uh, marsupials and the placentals effectively took over uh, northern and um, southern uh, America, more or less apart from small ones like possums that also successfully invaded the north. So this was the, an example of a natural, uh, a natural extinction uh, without any people, human beings involved. Uh, now, um, that, there were some huge mammals weren't there uh, that carried on until quite recently. I don't really know what their origin is, but things like South American giant sloths, for example, Yep, yep, those are uh, off South American origin and they go all the way up to Alaska. So we have slots like uh, Megalonyx, which makes it all the way from uh, South America all the way up to in, into Beringia, which is quite mm. remarkable for an animal like that. But, mm. you, but you've got lots of species and, and genera of, of ground sloth, which can be found all the way from parts of Brazil and Ecuador, all the way up into, into parts of North America. Things like Arimotherium, things like uh, Paramylodon, those lineages all, all came from South America, but they were quite successful in the North as well. Well, having said that, um, I mean, my understanding is that South America was effectively part of the maybe one of the, I mean, apart from Australia, one of the last la large, large sections of Gondwana land. Isn't it the case that uh, the origins of most of the placentals like these giant slots uh, could be traced to the north? Didn't the ancestors come from the north at some level? So uh, the xenarthrans or, or this, this sort, sort of large group, which includes ground slots, anteaters, uh, yeah. they may have had a sort of southern Gondwanan origin uh, oh, right. in, in South America itself. I don't think we have any ancestral remains of Xenarthrans in the north or in Eurasia. So I think they are a purely South American clade, which was isolated once Gondwana started to split apart. Okay, okay. Uh, if we were to go to go hair spitting about the exact origins of many, many uh, of some of these lineages, we, would, we, would, we wouldn't be able to exhaust uh, the time that we have at all. Uh, so I don't really want to go to too many details, but it's just very, very interesting. Um, and um, so, so during the faunal interchange, uh, the dominant the dominant mammals that took over were uh, North American forms that invaded South America, uh, and then uh, people moved in. Uh, human beings moved into North America roughly about uh, I don't know about depends on what you, who you believe in. Some people say fifteen thousand years ago, but I think that a settled figure is about I don't know twelve thousand years ago, something like that. So there are there are some sites in the north. I think Bluefish Cave and Paisley Caves, uh, which push. The arrival of people back to about 15, 16,000 years in North America. Uh, yeah. They were definitely going south by about uh, 14,000 years because we have sites in, in South America which, which date to about that. Um, yeah. They were in Beringia, so parts of, of uh, eastern Siberia and Alaska by somewhere between 30 and 25,000 years ago. Right. But, this was kind of like a holding pen because at yeah. this point there were these giant ice sheets which prevented the dispersal of people south of the ice and so it, it, yeah. it was only once the ice started to melt and the climate became more fa favorable that people started to go down the coast and through the ice free corridor. 
what, what would you can can you kind of remind me about that date again when people started maybe moving into North America? Yeah, so uh, south of the ice, we think by about fifteen thousand years. Fifteen thousand years ago, right? Okay. Um, now in the um, and also let's leaving let's leave aside Europe for the moment. Um, uh, uh, people moved out of Africa, shall we say, roughly about sixty thousand years ago, and then they started moving uh, eastwards. Um, large groups of them started moving eastwards and they managed to reach Australia by probably about 40,000 years ago, is that right? Well, so new evidence is suggesting that Homo sapiens left Africa sometime around 100,000 years ago, sometime oh, okay. around earlier in isotope stage five when it was a lot warmer and wetter and there were lots of rivers which went through the, 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 the Sahara and, and, and the Arabian Peninsula, which allowed the spread of, of, of uh, people. The fossil evidence for this is very scanty. However, there are tools which are thought to be associated with Homo sapiens, which have been dated to that. Now, the, there is fossil evidence of our species in the Arabian Peninsula, which dates to about 88,000 years. Right, right. And, and there's a site in Australia, which has been dated to about 65,000 years. So there, there are these early dispersals of people uh, out of Africa and into Eurasia and, yes. and Australia, which are taking place. It seems like there is, however, this second wave of migrations which takes place after about 60,000 years, which we can see in our genes. You can sort of, sort of uh, like use uh, molecular techniques to trace these dispersals back to about 60,000 years from Africa. But, but it's quite likely that there were multiple waves uh, yes. coming. Yes, and maybe in the, during, I mean, like maybe, we, I mean, as far as stories are concerned, that could have been a kind of genetic bottleneck and um, many, many modern humans might be from a genetic bottleneck that's theoretically a little bit more recent. This might be actually a good time to introduce something called the Toba eruption that took place. Did it take place in uh, Indonesia or did it take place in India? It was in Indonesia. Oh, Indonesia. Yeah, it was yes. in Indonesia. It was a volcano and the, the, the latest eruption was about 74,000 years ago. Yes. You, you, you see this layer of ash across South and Southeast Asia is called the youngest Toba tuff. Uh, so a, a, a tuff is basically just a, a layer of yes. volcanic ash, which you can see yes. as preserved. That's 70,000 years ago, is it? About 74. Yeah. And that caused, uh, would you say that it um, it, it was uh, sort of like uh, creating a bit of a tabula rasa as far as people were concerned in the Indian subcontinent or not really? Not really. So that was the prevailing idea for a long time. And then uh, colleagues of mine from, from the Max Planck Institute in Germany, yeah. who've been conducting excavations in parts of, of, of India, have found tool technologies that, that go almost continuously from below the tuff to above the tuff. So it seems like people in this part of the world were largely unaffected. Um, and colleagues of mine who've been working on faunas in Southeast Asia and in, 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 in India have shown that there's a surprising amount of faunal continuity. Things don't go extinct because of Toba. Right, right. So um, I just like to, like to be reminded of, uh, I'm sorry, my memory is not working so perfectly. Um, the earliest uh, er earliest people going to um, Australia, shall we say 50,000 years ago or something? Is that right? Well, it's oh. somewhere between 65 and 50,000 years, depending on who you talk to and, and, and which dates you want to believe. Yes. So apart from Africa, where people have been living the longest, uh, the next place people have been living the longest is probably Asia. Defined, I mean, Asia is a big word. And then, um, then um, Australasia gets gets taken over roughly uh, in fifty thousand years ago, and then uh, the Americas about fifteen thousand years ago, and, uh, and then various islands um, much much later. Yep. Yes. yes absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I think people reached Madagascar somewhere around twelve hundred years ago, and they reached New Zealand about seven hundred and fifty years ago. Yeah. Yes, and even I mean um, I understand that some of the earliest remains of uh, hu human tool making, I mean modern human tool making, has been found have been found in Sri Lanka from thirty thousand years ago. But you say that there's evidence of human tools uh, in, in the Indian subcontinent from much much longer. I mean, did you just mention eighty thousand years ago? Yeah. So if you think about humans as sort of just hominins, you know, our our distant relatives, which can include different species in the genus Homo, yes. Yes. we have in the Indian subcontinent, which go back to about 1.7 million years yes. ago. So yeah. we've had multiple species of hominin in the subcontinent for, for, for yeah. a long time. Now these microliths, which are these small blade-like tools, which are typically associated with our species, have been found in Fahain Cave, 
in Sri yeah. Lanka. Yes. And yes. those go back to about 48,000 years. So I think that is the oldest sequence of microliths that we found in Sri Lanka. Uh, and those microliths then persist all the way up into the, the, the Holocene. We have microliths from uh, sites in India, which date to about 45,000 years. So we know that if these microliths are truly associated with our species, yeah. Yeah. our species has been there for sure for about that time. And we have fossils of, of uh, people from these cave sites in Sri Lanka as well. Yes. Um, now, um, you, you've made a table of uh, extinction per capita uh, in, in, in this paper, uh, late quaternary extinctions. Mm -hmm. And um, what what is what is extinction per capita? I mean, I can I mean there are some nice figures here, but can you can I, can you just talk about extinction per capita? Uh, the per capita extinction rate is basically uh, it's a ratio of the species that survived through the extinction interval divided by the total number of of species that were there. So you're basically dividing the species that are living. Yes. Yes. By the total number of species which were there in the last fifty thousand years. So that's the all of the species that are living today, yeah. plus the species yeah. that are extinct. Yeah. So it's just a proportional a extinction, and yeah. you're standardizing that by the amount of time. So I, I'm, I, I standardize that by about 50,000 years. Rates can't be compared unless they're standardized by time. Yes. And I mean, your, your timestamp begins about 50,000 years ago. Uh, can we just um, put a little, I mean, I don't really want to go to details, but uh, we're talking about the, um, um, the, the, the period before the Holocene. Um, mm -hmm. okay, what, what's that? What, what's that? What's the name for that period once again? Pleistocene. Sorry. Uh, and the Pleistocene now is this like fifty thousand years ago? Is that a mid Pleistocene or late Pleistocene or is that a kind of name for that kind of particular it's phase latest, of the Pleistocene? It's the latest part of the Pleistocene. So the, the Pleistocene yeah. can be divided up into um, three rough time periods. We've got the early Pleistocene, which goes from about two point six million years to about yeah. one point eight. Then you have the middle Pleistocene, which goes from about, um, it, it's actually, actually no, it's from, uh, I think it's 2.6 2. to 800,000 years ago. Then the middle Pleistocene goes from about 800,000 years to about 100,000 years. And the late Pleistocene yes. is about 100,000 years to 12,000 years ago. All right, so we are talking about the late Pleistocene. The late Pleistocene uh, and, and the latest half of the late Pleistocene. Latest half. Uh, now, your extinction per capita figures uh, for uh, India, the Indian subcontinent is 0.69. Uh, for Africa, the figure is 0.34 to uh, 0.52. Uh, but when it goes, when it comes to places like um, South America, Europe, North America, and then uh, Australia, the, the figures are way in excess of like, well, more than one, two, three, even up to about four-ish. Mm -hmm. um, what do these figures mean? Like if we say two or three or four compared to, because um, if the extinction per capita was zero, it would be one, would it? So if the, if the per capita extinction, so if you had zero extinction. Oh, sorry, zero, sorry, yes. Yeah. Zero. It would be zero, mm -hmm. sorry. It would be zero. So any figure, okay. So India is approaching about one, but less than one. Yep, so we actually have very, very low rates of extinction in India and in, uh, in parts of Southern and Eastern Africa. Uh, yeah. you, get a, you, you get much higher rates of extinction in the Americas and in Australia. Yes, yes, yes. It's just, it's just like almost like a kind of total carnage, like in places like uh, the Americas and Australia, it's total carnage. Uh, in Europe, it was really bad. And we're also dealing with uh, creatures uh, larger than 50 kilograms. That's your kind of fig uh, that your definition of megafauna. That's my definition of megafauna. The per capita extinction rate is the extinction of everything. So it's not just animals weighing oh, more than right. uh, 50 ki kilograms. If you look at animals weighing more than 50 kilograms, the extinction rates are about the same. Yes. Um, based on a kind of, I mean, megafauna is actually relatively limited in terms of uh, uh, in terms of the percentage of total mammals, uh, I mean, uh, you know, they don't necessarily include too many rodents, for example. Maybe about two percent of uh, two percent of mammals, uh, historically speaking, could be regarded as really large. Um, yeah. But today, it must be a lot less. Uh, but the megafauna, even though they are not represented in, in terms of uh, large numbers of species, they were represented by biomass to a huge level. Uh, before recent times, weren't they? Yep, absolutely. And and we basically replaced 
the biomass of large animals with the biomass of our domesticated species and our species. Yes, yes. So, I mean, for example, I mean, like North American bison used to probably be like millions of bison roaming across North America. So, I mean, so before, before this extension, North America was as rich as Africa in terms yep. of uh, large mammals, you know, like, like, like lions and tigers and wolves and, uh, and there are some huge animals uh, roaming across the plains of North America that were completely wiped out by human beings. Um, so Africa looks like, looks like the place which, uh, which many other parts of the world resembled. Um, and to what extent would you say, I mean, kind of maybe going back a hundred years, to what extent is India comparable to Africa in terms of the diversity of large mammals? So India has fewer large mammals than Africa does. And, and part of that is just because of size. If you have a larger continent, you tend to, rec- to accumulate more large species. Yeah. Uh, India is just a subcontinent, right? So, yeah. so the smaller the area, the fewer species you, 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 you can have. This is also why Sh- Sri Lanka has fewer species than yeah. mainland India. The yeah. smaller the area, the fewer species you can pack into it. It's just uh, they, they basically the theory of island biogeography. But Africa is, is, a, is an enormous continent, which is yeah. why you can pack yeah. in some species, which is why there's so much opportunity for diversification of some yeah. of these large species. Yes, but I mean, wouldn't you say that um, in the Indian subcontinent probably has more diversity of large mammals than than Eurasia? Uh, well, so compared to northern Eurasia, absolutely. Yes, yes. Northern Eurasia would have looked more like India in the late Pleistocene because parts of northern Eurasia still had animals like large elephants and rhinos and lions, which you don't, and tigers, which which you just don't find today. Yes, yes. And I'm speaking in a kind of the post, after the post-extinction event, roughly about 10,000 years ago, uh, uh, presumably, I mean, let's say dating from about 10,000 years ago, um, India is probably the biggest, um, um, has got the largest assemblage of, 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 of large mammals uh, after Africa. Is that, is that a rough, rough, rough approximation? Yeah, so about South and, and, and Southeast Asia, I, I would sort of club uh, okay. the Indo-Malayan biogeographic province has sort of the largest, uh, has the second largest share of large mammals after Africa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's an important point. And uh, until recently, uh, there were at least three species of rhinoceros uh, in the Indian subcontinent that that are still extant, but but barely so. Uh, And um, and I, I mean, there have been so many books written by elephants. I mean, elephants used to be found on, I mean, all China, all over the place. Yep. Now, I just want to introduce something that I'm, I expect you might have heard about, uh, heard of. Uh, just a, it's just a kind of uh, stock expression, if you like, which is that um, uh, there are only two places in the world where elephants have survived. One of them is in Africa, and one of them is in Asia. And uh, in Africa, it's because of co-evolution, they got used to living with people. But in Asia, they got the protection of the king, as it were. Uh, now, if it wasn't for the protection of the king, uh, and, and all in all the rest of rest rest of the places of the world uh, where elephants weren't necessarily used as beasts of burden, they they became extinct. I mean that was probably anthropogenic. Um, but in India, I mean it was cultural factors and theoretically coevolution that made them that 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 enabled them to exist. Um, but I think that maybe you could find some holes in this argument, particularly to do with the protection of the king. So we don't really have a lot of evidence of. Uh, large-scale uh, domestic or quote-unquote domestication because Asian elephants were never truly domesticated until much l- later on, uh, yeah. so, till about, you know, maybe 2,000 years or even later than that, that we, okay. that we have any kind right. of evidence. Um, but we lost two species of proboscidean in the Indian subcontinent, which were quite large. You lost yes. Paleoclodon, yes. Maticus, and Stegodon. It yes. seems like these these Asian elephants managed to survive because they're better adapted to forest uh, uh, dwelling. There were more yeah. more kinds of, of refugia for them. Plus, yeah. Asian elephants once ranged from Turkey all the way to China. So even if local populations would have gone extinct, there are lots of source populations elsewhere for them to come and recover. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give you an, an example of this. It was a molecular study that was done by scientists at the, I think they're at the Indian Institute of Science, where they looked at sort of the mitochondrial clades of Asian elephants. And what they showed is that during glacial periods, when it was particularly dry um, and and, and cold, 
Asian elephants would occupy refugia in Sri Lanka and in Southeast Asia, and when it was more favorable, these clades would then expand out into the rest of the subcontinent. Mm -hmm. So I think where you still have a lot of tropical forests, these animals can can hide out. Yes. Now, um, I mean, maybe I, I think I have to force your hand a bit and push you, push the domestication of the Asian elephant slightly further back. I, I mean, maybe arguably it could be 3000 years ago, uh, because uh, I mean, Alexander the Great was um, had that famous battle in 300 BC. And around about the same time, maybe a, actually a bit later than that, the, the Hannibal, the Hannibal event where elephants were used to uh, attack uh, Italy. Uh, that was that was probably uh, un, unusually uh, the, the African elephant being used. I um, mean, that's, that's what the coins seem to show. Right. Uh, it, they may be African elephants. They also could be Asian elephants that they're getting mm -hmm. from right. because it, the Asian elephants were found all the way from there. I, I don't know much about the kinds of elephants that the Carthaginians used when they in, in uh, Nobody knows. I don't think very much. I think okay. that's speculation. Yes. Right. But, but, I mean, but, but the, the coins seem to show something more like an African African elephant, but who knows? Right, right, and there, 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 there were uh, elephants in North Africa, um, where sort of the the old Carthaginian civilization was. So it's possible, but I, I don't know of a lot of examples where African elephants have been tamed, like Asian elephants have. It's totally yeah. possible. I, I, I just don't know of any of that of that taking place. Uh, but yeah. but yeah, I, I mean, uh, it, it's it's certainly possible that. Uh, Elephants were used by people all the way back to about four thousand years because we 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 yeah. do see elephants in in this valley seals, uh, yeah. but I don't think there's any substantial evidence of widespread taming of elephants before that. Yes, so um, it's very good that you've mentioned that that would that would have been at least two more species of uh, elephants in uh, India. Maybe we'll come to them in a little bit. Um, you 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 mentioned uh, the pseudo extinction of uh, something called Boss nomadicus. Many, many of these animals seem to be having uh, the species name nomadicus. What does nomadicus mean, or does it refer to anything? So the nomadus is the Greek word for the Narmada River, which flows ah, okay. through. Okay, from the Narmada. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Uh, the the old taxonomic rule, as as I'm sure you're aware, is that you have to either Latinize a name or or turn it into Greek. And and so when yeah. Faulkner yeah. named a lot of these species, he called them nomadicus because they were initially found in the Narmada Valley. Yes, yes. And uh, one, one, um, one little question as well that I want to um, in interpose here. There was something that you mentioned called the Heinrich event. Is this, is this a, a type of event or is it a single event? What kind of does the Heinrich event? What's the Heinrich event that you refer to? There are actually multiple Heinrich events, which are basically just these millennial cold snaps, which, okay. which you saw yeah. in the Northern Hemisphere. Heinrich event one uh, was particularly cold and dry in South and Southeast Asia. You know, yeah. all of the records that we have from caves in, in India and in Southeast Asia point to this dramatic decline uh, in, in monsoon strength. Yes, during yes, yes. Period. So before I forget, I just want to insert that um, starting, starting uh, back from 50,000 years ago, the Himalayas would have been about uh, half a kilometer lower than they are now. <laughs> Apparently they're rising about one centimeter every year. So that, that, that right. makes it half a kilometer. So anyway, we, 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 go, we go through some, um, fortunately you've simplified a, a list of uh, really big animals that, uh, that sort of like either became extinct or pseudo extinct. So you've mentioned the two extinct elephants, Paleoloxodon nomadicus, Stegodon nomadicus. Uh, they happen to come on my list, list first of all. Then you've got Sus nomadicus. You don't actually discuss Sus nomadicus much in your paper. Uh, in yeah. Your last paper. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so this was a list in the Turby et al. paper, which was sort of a broad review of extinct, uh, of named extinct species in the subcontinent. The problem with Sus nomadicus is that when it was described, it was thought to be from quote unquote middle Pleistocene. Yes. Deposits yes. in yes. Central India. So we, we don't have good dates on these deposits, but presumably they're for, they, they age to, to somewhere between 780,000 years to about 200,000 years yes. ago. So much before this megafaunal extinction event. We currently don't have a definitive specimen of Sus nematicus in the latest part of the Pleistocene. Yeah. 
Yes. There are specimens that have been called it, but there's been no justification as to why they were called sus pneumatic. So I think yeah. more taxonomic work is required to be even see if some of these middle Pleistocene species persisted or if sus pneumaticus is just uh, an older pig and it was replaced by sus scrofa, which is the modern yes. sus wild boar. It's just quite interesting, isn't it, that the that the Sui Day, um, the Sui Day have their largest uh, center of uh, diversification in in Southeast Asia. Is that right? It it's somewhere in Asia. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and so scr so scr scrofa probably came from from the west, whereas mm -hmm. many other pigs are associated 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 with the east. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so um and then um which, which are which are oh yes we've got um, the pseudo uh, we've got apart from Paleoloxodon nomadicus stegodon and then we've got sus. Uh, Equus nomadicus, an extinct horse that used to live in India. That's an interesting, interesting animal. Yeah, so Equus nomadicus is a zebra-like horse, which was found in the in the the, the Narmada uh, uh, Valley. We 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 think it ranges from the Middle Pleistocene all the way up into the latest part of the of the Pleistocene. Yes, but uh, it's unclear what the exact age range is and how it's related to the Sivalic horse Equus sivalensis. Right. which is an older species, but we, the, the problem with a lot of this is that the holotypes come from unknown sections in India, yes. and so we can't go and date them. Yeah. And since then, no one has gone and systematically done a lot of uh, age estimations for these places where these fossils have been found. So a lot of the times what happens is that people go out and they find horse teeth, and they just call them Equus sivalensis because that's the kind of, of horse yeah. which is described from the Sibalics or Equus nomadicus because that's the kind of, of horse that's been described from central India. And it just takes a lot more uh, careful work to figure out exactly what's there and when they lived. Yes. Now, but, but um, you yeah. know that these Equus nomadicus -like, like forms are there in the late Pleistocene. Okay. So um, maybe it's a useful time to mention that the vast majority of extinct Indian animals, or very large numbers that have been described, were from the Siwalik Hills. But the Siwalik Hills predates the fifty thousand year horizon that we're talking about. Is that right? Yep. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. So uh, the the Siwalik record of mammals goes back about twenty three million years, yes. and we have almost continuous de deposition of mammal fossils going back from about twenty three million years all the way up to about half a million years. Uh, the record is mostly complete in the Miocene, sometime between about 15 and 5 million years ago. That, yeah. That's where we have the densest samples. Uh, it gets a lot more sparse as you move further back and further forward through time. A lot of these extinctions are just normal turnovers that you see. Some of them might be driven by climate, like the turnover that you see between the Pliocene and Pleistocene. It's somewhat similar to what we see in 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 North America, just in, 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 in terms of that, there was a big turnover taking place at about 2.7 million years ago. Yes. Uh, but yeah, all of these other extinctions, things like Sivotheres, which were big giraffes, uh, or the other kinds of, of uh, buffalo and antelope or pigs, they all take place a, a, a long time ago. And they, and they sort of take place at, at, at about the same time as similar turnovers that you see in parts of East Africa or in, in parts of Europe. Yes. Now, in the, at, at the present time, there are only about, uh, there are only two known species of hippopotamus to my knowledge. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of confusion about the hippopotamus that used to live in uh, India that, that, that falls onto, into the genus Hexaprotodon rather than the modern hippopotamus, which falls into the hippo genus, hippopotamus genus. Um, so there's a lot of confusion about exactly what, what species, but I think that isn't it easier to easier to just to talk about like maybe like one main species of hippo, um, hippo, hippo that probably existed, uh, I mean, in this region, including Sri Lanka? So here's where you, you again, you've got the, the problem of taxonomy. Hexaprotodon paleoindicus and Hexaprotodon nematicus are both found in, from these central Indian deposits. Yes. The only way to tell them apart is by looking at the size of the second lower incisor Yes. compared to the first and third. Nematicus has slightly larger second incisors compared to Pele in Indicus. It's yes. unclear if this is just a highly variable population of hippos that lived uh, at the same time because we don't have good dates for where the holotypes came from. Yes. We also don't have a lot of good data. And if you don't find the mandibular symphysis, 
Yes. You can't tell what species you're actually uh, dealing with. You, you've got a hippo in Sri Lanka, which Paul is uh, there in Yagla called yeah. Buran, uh, Singhalaya think, or something. He, yeah. always, he, he gave lots of these Singhalaya right. type names. Yeah. Right. yeah. right. And it's unclear if this is the same species as the hippo from central India or if it's a separate, um, you know, insular uh, species from Sri Lanka. I think we just need to go and well, one, date all the deposits. The All of these uh, fossils from, from Sri Lanka are coming out of the... the yeah. Uh, Ratnapura cave. Yes, yes, Ratnapura it, cave, yeah. It's hard to tell just how old they are until we go and e either directly date them or date the layers of 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 of, of, uh, of sediment where they're uh, yeah. coming from. Um, and then um, last on our list, but not least, is uh, Bos nomadicus, which probably evolved into the modern day zebu cattle. Is that right? Yep, yep. So I think genetics st uh, studies have shown that the zebu is, is a sort of South Asian uh, domestic form, and it seems to have evolved there. Uh, Bos nomadicus uh, is this wild type that we see. And these wild type morphs persist till about 5,000 years. The first evidence of domestication comes from a site in Baluchistan. It's called Mergar. It's an it's an Indus Valley site yeah. where we start seeing the first evidence of domesticated cattle. So there's about a 5,000 year overlap between these wild morphs and domesticated morphs. But over time, the the wild type seems to go away, and all we're we're left with is the domesticated. Yeah. And Vos nomadicus is is it is it very similar to the European auroch? Is it more or less the same kind of taxon? So he's, yeah, so some people have have called nomadicus a subspecies of the European auroch. Uh, yeah. The European auroch is both primogenous. Some people have called the European species both primogenous, primogenous, and the Indian species both primogenous, nomadicus. Uh, there are distinct differences in the skulls. I, th I think it's enough to warrant calling the Indian form a separate species. Yes. Uh, yeah. But I think once we start getting a lot of ancient D uh, DNA and comparing them, we'll we'll get better answers for what's going on. Okay, so let's let's get to the most exciting creatures according to uh, at least the videos available on YouTube. Um, Stegodon and Paleoloxodon. How big were they? So Paleoloxodon was probably one of the biggest elephants to have ever lived. Uh, based on my estimates, I've gotten some specimens at about fourteen tons. Yeah. Modern Asian elephant males can reach about six tons, so this is twice the size of an Asian elephant bull, which is yeah. which is quite a sizable elephant. Yes, Egadon nomadicus is harder to figure out because it was largely known from teeth, um, and then people found three skulls. I haven't gotten access to these skulls yet to actually get a good estimate on their size. A colleague of mine uh, found uh, a skeleton of Stegodon but it was too fragmentary once they pulled it out. So I'm, I'm, I'm just still waiting on either access to, to those skulls that were discovered in the 80s or for someone to find a new specimen. Based on the specimens that I've seen, I would say it's about similar in size to some of the stegodons that we have from the Sibaliks from, 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 from the older uh, part of the record. And they range in size from about, you know, five to seven tons, so about the size of, of the modern day elephant. Now, Stegodon, is it uh, the Stegodon nomadicus? You refer to Stegodon Ganesha, which seems, or Ganesha, which seems to be better known. Uh, that, 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 is, that probably lived uh, longer than 50,000 years ago, but that's better known, isn't it? It's not. So Stegodon Ganesha oh. is known from one skull. Oh, right. And th 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 this has been a taxonomic mess that was committed by F Falconer when he named the, the species. Yeah. So uh, Hugh Falconer was this naturalist who came to India in the 1830s. Uh, he, he was a doctor and was in charge of the Saharanpur Botanical Garden. And he got to know of these fossils in the Sivalik Hills. So he goes out and starts collecting fossils along with a couple of uh, army en engineers from the East India Company. Yeah. And they start to accumulate this great collection of fossils. And from this collection, he names two stegodons. He calls one stegodon insignis and the other one stegodon ganesa. Yes. He named, he supposedly named them for teeth, but it's unclear because his notes have never been clear about what he's naming these species on. Because he says that here's a tooth of stegodon insignis and here's a tooth of stegodon ganesa. What's remarkable is that they're very similar despite their skulls being very 
different. That would imply that he had thought of the names for the two skulls that were found. Yes. The problem though is that it's hard to actually do stegodon taxonomy from teeth. The yes. teeth are so similar that you actually need other kinds of evidence to uh, say for sure that it's one species or the other. So far we have one skull of stegodon, uh, stegodon ganesa from the, from the Sivalix from an unknown period of time. Yes. Uh, we have presumably a second female skull, which is in Calcutta. I'm currently trying to figure out if I can work out subtle differences in the teeth to actually see if there are, if there are uh, any differences between Stegodon insignis and Ganesa. Um, yeah. Uh, but but I'm just long-term. What, what I noticed about Stegodon was that it had gigantic thick tusks, uh, very long yeah. tusks. Uh, and um, just for information, I think that Paleoloxodon used to also occur in, in Europe and, 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 and the UK um, um, until mm -hmm. uh, not too long ago before, before it became extinct. So it was a Eurasian genus as well, wasn't it? Yep, yep. So Paleoloxodon actually uh, comes from Africa. The earliest Paleoloxodon, Paleoloxodon recchi, is about a million years old and is found in East Africa. Then yes. they leave Africa and they come out and then you start finding Paleoloxodon Loxodon in the in parts of Israel and the Middle East, and then you see Paleoloxodon spread out from e everywhere from from Britain all the way to uh, Turkmenia in Central Asia to Japan, and then of course uh, China, South Asia, Sri Lanka, yes. and uh, and and of course parts of Southeast Asia. So it, it's a fairly wide ranging genus of elephant. And Paleoloxodon uh, outlived uh, outlived Stegodon, is that right? Well, it's, we only have three dated sites from Stegodon. So based on the currently available data, yes. yes. But this can change in, in the future if we find uh, sites which are, are much younger that contain Stegodon. It yeah. seems like, like, like Stegodon goes extinct at around that time, even in parts of China and Southeast Asia. So it's like a maybe, maybe we have to we have to clarify because a certain species of stegodon carried on until about according to what some records four thousand years ago in some of these little islands, uh, but uh, we're mainly referring to the Indian subcontinent here. Right. So there there actually isn't good evidence of stegodon persisting till about four thousand years. Right. Uh, yeah. There was some evidence that stegodon may have persisted until much later, but we don't have any good dates which corroborate that. Uh, we do have Stegodon on islands in, in, in Indonesia, but it, those all seem to go extinct sometime in the middle Pleistocene. Yes. So let's just try to give some extinction dates for, the, for, the, for, for, for some of these, uh, these, anim these creatures. So Stegodon and Paleoloxodon, um, to what extent did they carry on into the Holocene or did they all, both became, become extinct before the Holocene? Before the Holocene, as far as we know. 20,000 years ago, is, would you say? So. Uh, Paleoloxodon probably around 15,000, Stegodon sometime after 30,000 years. Okay, so uh, the last glacial maximum was, was about, that's about 20,000 years ago, isn't it? The last glacial maximum is actually around 20, between 26 and 22. Yeah, okay. All right, so um, I, I don't think that we can necessarily associate uh, these dates of extinction with, with 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 that glacial event, although to some extent we might be able to. Um, um, so we're, we're saying about fifteen thousand years ago for the extinction of the elephants. Would you say this, for these oh. these genera? Yeah. By then, yeah, both of them are gone. Yeah, and just for information, uh, would would Elephas maximus have been living alongside uh, these two species? So there would have been three species of elephant living in Absolutely. India. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and somehow it was somehow it could. It could manage, whereas these two probably larger, larger elephants couldn't really manage terribly well. Maybe due to anthropogenic eff effects. Yeah. So it, what what seems to be going on, at least with these megafaunal extinctions worldwide, is that when you see climatic changes, uh, species populations get smaller. They get stressed out because their preferred climate and their preferred food sources start to dwindle. Yes. Once you get smaller geographic uh, distributions, you start seeing inbreeding, you see limited gene flow, and yeah. a lot of these large species are also slow to reproduce. So elephants, for example, stay pregnant for two years, and there's about six years between calving events. So yeah. it just takes a long time for these populations to rebound. 
at least for Alphas Maximus, we know that it had a fairly large range. We know that Paleoloxodon and Stegodon were restricted to the Indian subcontinent. So there just wasn't enough of them out there to sustain these populations in the long term. And then all you need is, is people coming in and adding to that, 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 that uh, existing stress on these species. Yes, yes. So now, um, now you say you say that this is your paper is um, well. First of all, you say you say in your paper that uh, your paper helps to explain why the Indian subcontinent retains several species of large mammals. Um, how do you think your paper helps to explain why the Indian subcontinent retains several species of large mammals? Yeah. So uh, the the low extinction rate and the low extinction magnitude and the similarity to what we see in Africa, which is just this long-term survival of large species, points to some kind of co-evolution of the fauna right. uh, with, with humans uh, sensu lato, you know, like lato. multiple yeah. species of, of, yes. of, of people. Uh, that's, that's I, I think, a big reason why we still see a lot of large species in, in the subcontinent. That coupled with the fact that uh, there are lots of refugia, there's a lot more habitat connectivity here. Yes. Uh, there are lots of source populations for a lot of these species outside of India. So even if you, you had black bucks going e extinct in parts of central India, you had black bucks in parts of, of Western India and Pakistan and Afghanistan, which could have come and recolonized. You can actually see this in parts of South America where uh, populations of, 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 I think there are Wanakos go extinct, but then a different population will come and replace it. Yes, yes. Now you say, you, 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 you say that the paper is evidence of co-evolution. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, in Africa, uh, people have been living as alongside animals um, for, shall we say, 100,000 years. Uh, in in uh, the, the, the kind of horizon we're talking about is 50,000 years. Do you think that in the horizon is long enough for evolution to take place? Yeah, so people have been, so humans have been in Africa. Humans evolved in Africa, right? So yes. multiple species have lived alongside the lineages of species which are found in Africa today. Our species shows up sometime around 300,000 years ago. And we know it's from 300,000, the- 300,000, did you say? It's yeah. about 300,000. Yeah. I thought it was more like 120,000 or something. No, it's, it's oh. been pushed back to about okay. 300,000 years. Uh, yeah. And based on archeological evidence from the Indian subcontinent, we know that hominins have been here for about 2 million years. Yes. And it's possible that our species was here for 60,000 years, if not longer. Yes. And so it, it's a long time for, the, for these groups of species to adapt to whatever group we are doing on the landscape. Yes, so so this this has to be contrasted with um, uh, places like Australia and uh, the Americas. Uh, I mean, America certainly. I mean, if people got there about fifteen thousand years ago, that didn't really give them enough time to adapt, and that would have been a gigantic overkill theoretically taking place. What about Australia? I mean, uh, yes, Australia. We're dealing with marsupials that probably couldn't cope uh, with uh, with whatever people represented. Uh, and um, they probably, uh, maybe there's evidence of the Australian creatures kind of falling like a pack of dominoes uh, from about, I don't know, 50,000, 40,000 years ago when people did get there. Yeah, so, so people show up in Australia sometime between 50 and 65,000 years ago, and the extinctions start at about 45 and continue to about 35,000 years. So yeah. it, it, it takes a certain amount of time for human populations to build up. Um, yeah. And then we don't have to kill off every last individual. You know, like this, this yeah. overkill model, I think is an oversimplification of what we're yeah. actually doing yeah. on the landscape. Yeah. We can kill off just enough individuals of a species, which is already stressed out, yeah. such that the replacement rate, which is two, goes down, or, or the fertility rate goes below replacement. Yes. And once you get that, then a population is just on the path to extinction. Yes. Um, at the same time, you have animals like elephants, which are ecosystem engineers. Yes. They tend to knock down trees. They tend to preserve a certain kind of environment. We've seen this in parts of Africa. And yes. if you start killing those off or if those species go extinct first, then, ha then habitats change and you can start seeing secondary extinctions take place as well. 
this is the, the, the case with a lot of carnivores, or at least that's how we think of, of the extinction of large uh, carnivores in the in the Americas. Yeah, yeah. Prey goes extinct, and once their their primary prey goes extinct, it's a lot harder for them to to, to survive. So you are kind of referring to cascade ex extinction events. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yes. So um, so I think that we could argue that people uh, animals have been exposed to human beings for approximately the same period of time in Australia and in the Indian subcontinent, um, but the influence of humans in the Indian subcontinent was more benign, maybe partly because of refugia and maybe uh, maybe they were just better adapted because they weren't all marsupials. It's, it's possible, but then you've got the, the Americas where they're all placentals and, and they go extinct because of... But, but isn't, that, isn't that kind of like... Um, I mean, they didn't really, you could argue that they didn't have too much time to co-evolve because we're only talking about 10,000 years or something uh, for them to deal with human beings, whereas in Indian. Right, but in the Indian context, you had different species of humans there for about 2 million years. In Australia, yeah. you have one species. Yeah. And the yeah. same thing that we see in the Americas is the same thing that we see on oceanic islands in the Caribbean and Madagascar and in, in New Zealand. People yeah. show up and we're the only species of, of, of humans to ever be there. And yeah. then you start seeing a large scale extinction. Well, isn't that isn't that the case to argue that uh, our particular species, Homo sapiens, particularly in, in its in its later phase of its history, is vastly more violent uh, than than some of these more extinct, uh, more more uh, archaic humans? It's I wouldn't say they're more violent. I would just say that they're more efficient at mm -hmm. uh, constructing their own niche and surviving. Yeah. So these these microlith tools that I was talking to you about, they're more sophisticated than some of these older tools. They're yeah. thought to be used as projectile points. So once people can are, are going to use them as bows and arrows or as spear points, hunting becomes a lot more efficient. Yes. So, so we can say that in both of these continents, uh, animals encountered humans at approximately, well, modern day humans at roughly about the same, same period of time, or at least from about 50,000 years ago, both of them, both of them noticed, well, they, they were affected by a similar kind of uh, human impact, but it was far more benign in, in Asia. Right, and that's, our, I, I think, one of the most surprising parts of my study is that I, I, I in initially expected these extinctions to take place a lot er, 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 earlier than the dates show. Yeah. Um, because that's the pattern that we see elsewhere on, on the planet. But, the fact that there, there's this huge time lag between the arrival of people and the extinction suggests that maybe humans are doing something else on the subcontinent that they're not doing in other parts, or it just takes a certain amount of population pressure uh, to really push these animals over the edge, especially animals which have adapted to whatever humans are doing. Yes, and, and, and just to reiterate, um... They, they certainly had a lot of time to co-evolve, certainly in the Indian subcontinent compared to Australia. Absolutely. Yes, yes. much, much longer. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Now, just a point of contention about the, the, the definition of a continent. You were saying that the, the Indian subcontinent is just a subcontinent. Couldn't the same thing be said about uh, Europe, do you think, in, in your opinion? Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I don't think Europe is a continent at all. It's just okay. that we have a good fossil record from there, which is why I... I separated it out. So, so, so we, we can refer to Eurasia. Um, I mean, if, if, we, if we recognize Europe as a continent, then we have to recognize the Indian subcontinent as a continent as well, don't you, in, by, that, by that kind of definition? Sure, absolutely, which is why I don't think Europe is a continent. I think Europe is a subpart of the larger continent of Eurasia. And yeah. to get at a Eurasian extinction rate or extinction magnitude, we need better data from parts of Southeast Asia, parts of China, parts of Western Asia, and we just don't have a lot of data from there. Yes, yes. Um, so, um, like, kind of moving, moving slightly towards um, the, the current um, modern day history. I mean, especially the Holocene. Um, um, I, 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 by the way, I, I just happened to do a tiny bit of uh, work on uh, on uh, the occurrence of the tiger in Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. and um, according to the paper that got written down, um, the um, they, they came to the conclusion because once upon a time it was uh, it was thought that it was lions that used to live in uh, live in Sri Lanka, uh, but uh, then the then uh, all the statistics uh, seem to indicate that it was it was a tiger, but then they looked at the bo uh, at the teeth again and and uh, this is uh, one of the, my colleagues and he and he showed it to somebody else and they said no no on the basis of the teeth 
and the morphological differences in the teeth, we can say that both the lion and the tiger lived in Sri Lanka. Now, I actually, personally speaking, I doubt this. I think that the I think that the tiger was certainly certainly present because it's found in South South India, but I think it's unlikely theoretically that the lion was there. And one of the reasons I'm saying this, and I just like to get your opinion about this, is that there has been a book that was written that you might be familiar with, that is called. Uh, well, actually, I'm not really sure if I've got a, but it's it's written by Romila Tapa, mm -hmm. and it's um, and it's basically arguing that oh yeah, it's called Exotic Aliens. Uh, the Lion and the Cheetah in India by, by Valmik Tapa and others, uh, published in 2013. And this argues that actually the lion, and the, uh, the lion and the Cheetah were not really native Indian creatures, that they were actually probably brought in by, uh, by the Mughal, Mughal influences and various other things. And they were introduced for hunting purposes, that sort of stuff. Now, we could, we could argue until the cows come home about this, but uh, certainly when it comes to, there's more certainty that there's more doubts about the lion as being natural to India compared to the cheetah. Do you have any remarks about this? Yeah, no, no, I do, because I, I actually did some picking around on this uh, subject for a colleague of mine. So phylogeographic analyses suggest that the Bengal tiger yes. diverged from uh, tigers in Southeast Asia by about 50,000 years. So we know that tigers should have been in the subcontinent by about 50,000 years. Yes. Before that, we don't actually have any good evidence for tigers there. Yeah. Modern day Asiatic lions are more closely related to the Barbary lions from yes. North Africa. Yes. And the molecular splits suggest that they diverge by about 35,000 years ago. Yes. So tigers come in at about 50,000 years, lions come in at about 35,000 years. Both yes. of those big cats should be in the subcontinent by that time. Yes. Yes. Now, a colleague of mine has found um, a, I think it's a humerus of a pantherine cat yes. from central India. We don't have any dates on this yet. And yes. it's actually hard to tell lions and tigers apart from their post crania. Yeah. Yes. So right now it's just, you know, panthera. Yes. Uh, yes. Other sites in and around there have been dated to around 30,000 years, which is fine. It, it, it makes sense given that both of these uh, cats were in the subcontinent at that time. Yeah. Yes. There is evidence of a large pantherine from the Kurnal Caves in South India. Yes. Uh, we don't have good dates on when, it's, but it's probably a leopard or some other kind of large pantherine cat. And, and of course, you've got the, the evidence from Sri Lanka. Yeah. Um, we all suggest that there's something there. It's quite probable that, you know, lions and tigers disperse south, but the fossil record of carnivores is so bad that it's just hard to tell yeah. exactly what's going on. Yeah, but it seems to be as well, I mean, uh, looking at it ecologically, I mean, lions seem to be preferring open savanna-like habitats, and, uh, and this is associated with northern India. Whereas it's not really the case in southern India and Sri Lanka, which used to be, which was far more forested and, and wetter. Right. right now, though, right that, now. Okay. that's 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 the environment in a in a warm interglacial. But right. when you had glacial environments and when you had a land bridge connecting uh, the mainland uh, to, Sri, to Sri Lanka, there was probably a savanna corridor somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. which allowed animals like you know elephants and rhino and and hippos to disperse from 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 the northern part of the subcontinent down to sri lanka so so you dispute the 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 existence of the the non-existence of the lion in india you think that the lion was certainly the well, an, an animal that carried on from 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 a long time ago yeah i mean at least the modern clades diverge at about thirty five thousand years so we know that 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 that's sort of a minimum estimate for when uh, lines were in South Asia. Uh, yeah. It's possible that there are older lineages that have gone locally extinct that we just don't know of. Uh, yes. And if, if we find bones and if we can get ancient DNA, we, we, we can shed more, li more light on that. And this, this, this has been shown uh, elsewhere as well, is that sometimes you, you have these older clades which go locally extinct and then a new clade will come in and replace them. It's possible that this is what happened with lions, but you know, you, you, you have lions all the way across Eurasia. Yes. Uh, yes. And it, it's highly uh, likely that they were there. Um, yes, I mean, so, so to, to cut a long story short, I think that this Exotic Aliens book is highly questionable. Having said that, it is possible that, um, that the, the indigenous lion could have got extinct 
uh, could have experienced widespread extinction, which is why it was bolstered by populations from Africa and other places, probably North Asia, by, by various rulers who wanted some, something to hunt. Uh, I don't know of any evidence of that because so far the Asiatic lines, at least from gear, yes. are genetically most similar to those from Northern Africa. It's possible that more, but the similar, but 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 we do see divergences. So they aren't North African lions in India. It is a separate Indian clade, but it's allied to the clade from from North Africa. So I think it's highly unlikely that they brought in lions from right Africa or from of or from the Middle East to replace populations. I think the lion populations crashed uh, very recently in time. If you look at British uh, hunting records yes. and for these, these, these old field guides to animals from the Indian subcontinent, there are, there are records of lions all the way from, from Pakistan up to Bengal. Yes, yes. So, and cheetahs, they are found in, they're just about hanging about in Iran now, uh, native mm -hmm. cheetahs. So cheetahs were probably also native to India. Yep. Yes, yep. yes, yes. I think so, all of the species are native. I, I think, uh, once more zoo archaeological evidence and paleontological evidence comes out, we'll start to see that these animals actually have a fairly long history in the Indian subcontinent and weren't brought in by, 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 by kings for yeah. hunting purposes. So, 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 so this book is to be disputed, this exotic aliens book. So uh, to, to kind of wrap up, I just want to finish off by maybe talking a little bit about elephants. Now, elephants did get the protection of the king uh, relatively recently speaking, I mean, shall we say from, shall we say, rough figure from 5,000 years ago when they maybe were, they were domesticated little by little. And they've been used extensively in countries like Thailand and Burma and Southeast Asia and South Asia. And uh, they, 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 they were tractable enough to, to domesticate them. And they could only be caught from the wild. So they had to preserve wild populations in order to uh, harvest them regularly. So this has been, um, culturally the influences have, have played a role in preserving some of some of the Indian subcontinent's megaphone, hasn't it? Uh, except that Asian elephants today are quite endangered. They're restricted to very few uh, pockets in national parks. And yes. I'm not counting the elephants which are kept in temples or for other, you know, an anthropogenic purpose. Wild populations are fragmented. They're in these, you know, little pockets of habitat in the sea of humanity. And there's an increase in human wildlife uh, conflict when it comes to yes, to elephants. Yes, yes, uh, yes. So whatever uh, incentive there may have been in the past to preserve some of these animals, all of that is gone. And, you know, the yes. cost of ivory seems to trump a lot of this. And and the cost of f farmland seems to, seems to overcome a lot of these animals. Yes, I mean, so this is a, this is very much a like a 20th century and late 20th century uh, phenomenon that elephants are becoming access to requirements if you, if you um, in, a, in a certain economic way of thinking about it. Uh, but it's a miracle, isn't it, in so many ways that uh, large animals like elephants um, have survived and and um, and more vulnerable animals like rhinoceroses have just about hung on until now when all kinds of reasons have, have made them completely disappear. Right. So this is actually a project that I'm working on right now to try and figure out what the pattern of range decline was like for some of these endangered species in the Indian subcontinent. Rhinos yeah. seem to face the same fate as some of these other large megafauna in parts of central India. So they're there in central India until the end of the Pleistocene. Yes. By the earliest part of the, of the Holocene, sometime between 10,000 and 5,000 years ago, you can still uh, find them in the Gangetic Plain. Uh, yeah. After that, they're found in the Indus Valley in parts of, of Pakistan, uh, yeah. all, all, all along the, the course of those, of those, of those uh, streams and rivers. And they're found uh, in parts of, of the Terai in North India, and of course, in West Bengal. But they seem to go extinct everywhere else. And this seems to happen after about 2,000 years years ago. It's probably a combination of population pressure and hunting, which is causing these rhinos to go extinct. I mean, isn't it the case also that intelligence might play a role because uh, more intelligent animals might, might, have a, might have strategies for surviving. So elephants had, were smart enough theoretically, but who knows? What about, I mean, maybe you want to make a comment about hippos as well, because hippos are pretty aggressive creatures, but they kind of just disappeared from India, maybe about 10,000 years ago. Is that right? 
go extinct at about 10,000 years. And I think there are multiple uh, factors. You know, these large animals, when they're stressed out, they don't breed. And if you don't have large enough populations, uh, you will eventually get population collapse and extinction. Yes. Uh, coupled with whatever little hunting that is that is going on. Um, we we we've seen this in parts of Africa with extant hippos, where if they if they if there if there's a drought, for example, they will just have a bad calving year, and that if if that keeps going on for 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 hundreds of years, then it's just going to spell uh, trouble for these animals. Yes, well, I, I'm I'm just coming to coming to a close now. I think it's a miracle that uh, so many large animals have survived in India, and it's a wonderful thing that your paper reveals the reason that they managed to survive until very recently, and then that they came under considerable hunting pressure uh, during col colonialism, and also later on, uh, thanks to uh, habitat destruction and um, you know the trade in various uh, animal parts. Uh, but it's, I think it's uh, wonderful that in India, at least right now, there's a high interest in uh, uh, nature conservation, and uh, at least uh, there seems there seem to be more, 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 more action with regards to making corridors and uh, ensuring that things like tigers and elephants have can carry on, carry on a bit longer. Um, that, that's, that's a bit of a miracle story here, isn't there? Isn't that about how these large animals did manage to survive? I mean, it's not just the, the wind ones we've talked about so far. There's also the gore, which is an amazing animal that there's some evidence that it was seen in, in Sri Lanka, but it became extinct quite recently, about maybe 19th century. Um, so it's just uh, amazing that these creatures are still in this most highly populated country in the planet. Oh, absolutely. I'm continually amazed by the fact that the subcontinent still retains large mammals. Uh, it, with one point, what, it's 1.3 billion people, the kind of, 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 of stress on ecosystems now is unprecedented. Yes. And you're absolutely right. These, these, these corridors are extremely important. One of the, the reasons why these species may have survived uh, all this long is because they could go from patch of, of uh, good habitat to the other uh, or from one refugia to the other one because of these corridors. Uh, and, and so I, I think these corridors need to be preserved if these, if these animals have, are gonna have any chance of, 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 of surviving here. One, one last point, if I may, I know I'm kind of like pushing your, pushing your time level a little bit. Uh, now I've read a, a very interesting chapter in a book uh, called Jungle Tide by John Still about how elephants were the first uh, creatures to, to make roads through forests, uh, at least in, in a Sri Lankan context, and I'm sure that it would have been the same in India. So elephants have played a pivotal role, haven't they, in human civilization in these countries as road builders. This is something that's not known about large animals, that they were responsible for um, like uh, habitat transformation and making roads that other creatures, including people, did start using as well. Oh, absolutely. El El uh, proboscideans have been ecosystem engineers from when they attained a, a certain size. Um, and lots of species make use of these, of these elephant paths in forests, including people. Yes, yes. Do you have any final remarks uh, about... Um... I mean, have you had any positive feedback about your work? And I, I expect that this is a rich area that's developing now. Right. I, I, I think what I'm going to say is that this is the first step in trying to understand these extinctions in the Indian subcontinent. We need much better dates. We need to do studies on ancient DNA if we can get hands on it. We need to do basic taxonomic work and go back and do more, more uh, field work. A lot of the data that I uh, collected has been gathered by archaeologists and paleontologists from the 60s and 70s and yes. 80s. Uh, so a lot of the data is still pretty old and we, we need to go and collect more, more uh, samples and do fresh surveys to get more robust estimates of the extinction, uh, try and, and figure out if, if anything else had gone extinct. And at, at the end of the day, I, I think I could just kind of want to dispel this, this, this myth of the overkill Hypothesis. Right. Yes. Overkill and people like to um, talk about the cause of the of the megafaunal extinction as a binary, right? Was it people or was it climate? Yes. Yes. I would like to rephrase that conversation in as in the absence of people, would you still see the same pattern and magnitude of extinction that we see today? Yes. And so far the evidence suggests no. This right. doesn't mean the climate is off the hook, it just means that. Climate is necessary, but not sufficient to show the, the, the patterns that we're seeing. So I, I have had the pleasure of talking to uh, 
Dr. Advait Zhuka from the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. He's a vertebrate paleontologist and he's um, written some exciting papers about the megafaunal extinctions in India. Thank you very much for your time. Yep, absolutely. Oh, and one uh, quick point. I'm actually at Yale now, so I, I oh, okay. my, right. my Smithsonian affiliation, but I'm a Gaylord Donnelly postdoctoral associate in the Department of Anthropology at Yale. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.